On the rails of 1914, in Pennsylvania, a single hill broke every train that tried to climb it. Erie Railroad wanted a machine so powerful it would end gridlock forever. A locomotive with 24 driving wheels, more muscle than anything on earth. Yet when it finally thundered to life, Cruz realized this beast was too strong for its own heart. It could shatter couplers, but it was gasping for steam within minutes. What went so catastrophically wrong that raw power collapsed under its own weight? The answer begins with the hill nobody could conquer. Eastbound trains on the Erie Main Line hit a wall at Susquehanna Hill. The grade up to Gulf Summit stretched just a few miles, but the incline, between 1.4% and 1.8%, turned every loaded coal drag into a test of survival. On paper, that is not the steepest climb in the East. In practice, it was the bottleneck that strangled the entire railroad. Dispatcher's logs from 1913 show lines of trains stalled at the foot of the grade, waiting for helpers to arrive. At peak hours, crews sat for hours, burning coal just to keep steam up, while the queue stretched back toward Binghamton. Three or four locomotives lashed together, sometimes more, were needed to shove a single train over the summit. Each helper meant another crew, another hour lost to coupling, brake tests, and the slow, dangerous process of getting all that weight moving as one. Slack ran out, couplers snapped, and the risk of a runaway was never far away. The line's capacity shrank to whatever the summit could swallow. For the Erie, this was not just a headache. It was a crisis that cost money, time, and sometimes lives. Coal had to move east, but every ton faced the same choke point. Crews and managers alike dreamed of a single engine strong enough to break the logjam, a machine that could make helper cues and bottlenecks a thing of the past. Matt Shea had spent decades on the Erie, his hands black with coal dust, his nerves worn by the endless struggle over Susquehanna Hill. He knew the cost of every stalled train, extra crews, wasted fuel, and a schedule that never caught up. Shea's frustration was not just personal. It was written into the Erie Railroad's balance sheets, echoed in complaints from dispatchers and the tired jokes in the roundhouse. The railroad was bleeding money and time, all for want of a better way up one stretch of track. The old system, three, sometimes four engines lashed together, was a patch, not a solution. Each helper meant another crew on the payroll, another set of risks with every coupling and every brake test. Accidents and delays were the price of doing business, but Shea believed it did not have to be that way. He started pushing for a new kind of answer, one engine big enough to do the work alone. No more herding a pack of locomotives up the hill, no more bottlenecks at the summit. Internal memos from Erie management show a growing impatience with the status quo. The cost of helper service was stacking up and the board wanted something drastic. Shea's vision, a single unstoppable pusher, caught their attention. They were not just chasing efficiency, they wanted to make a statement. If one machine could replace three, the Erie would leap ahead of its rivals and turn its most stubborn problem into a showcase of modern engineering. With that mandate, the challenge was set. The brief to Baldwin was simple but bold. Build one engine that could shove a full coal train over Gulf Summit without backup. No compromises, no half measures. For Shea and the Erie, it was all or nothing. The age of the single engine super pusher had begun. George Henderson's idea did not begin with more of the same. Instead, he reached for something no one else dared. A locomotive with three engines, each one a set of eight driving wheels, all packed beneath a single boiler and tender. The patent drawings from 1914 laid it out in bold lines, front engine, center engine, and then the shocker, a third engine buried under the tender. This was not just a bigger mallet, it was a new animal. 24 powered wheels, all clawing at the rails, made the thing look more like a steel centipede than a conventional locomotive. The official wheel arrangement reads like a code, but it is simple when you break it down two leading wheels, then three sets of eight drivers, then two trailing wheels at the very end. Normal engines had eight drivers. Big mallets doubled that. Henderson's triplex tripled it. 
The real leap came with the powered tender. Instead of letting the tender just carry coal and water, Henderson turned it into a full-fledged engine. The rear set of eight drivers sat directly under the tank, powered by steam exhausted from the main cylinders. The idea was to use every pound of the tender's weight to add traction, no wasted mass, no idle wheels. That meant, as long as the tender was full, the triplex could grip the rails with everything it had. On paper, this was the ultimate answer to the Erie Railroad's problem. No more three locomotive lash-ups, no more helper crews. Just one monster stretching nearly 100 feet, with six cylinders and a continuous chain of drivers from smoke box to rear coupler. Baldwin's shop blueprints show a boiler so long it needed a flexible joint in the middle just to manage curves. Every inch of the machine was designed for brute force, with the numbers to back it up, 160,000 pounds of tractive effort, almost double what any rival could claim. The ambition was clear, build a machine that could do the impossible and put an end to the bottleneck once and for all. Baldwin's erecting shop in 1914 was a world of steel, sweat, and ambition. The order from Erie called for something no one had ever tried, an engine with three separate sets of driving wheels, all powered by a single boiler. The shop floor echoed with the clank of rivets and the rattle of steel plates as crews set about building a machine that would weigh nearly 850,000 pounds when finished. Every piece was oversized. The boiler alone stretched so far that it could not stay rigid. Baldwin's engineers built a flexible joint into the middle, a kind of steel hinge that let the triplex snake around curves without tearing itself apart. Six massive cylinders waited for steam, two up front, two in the middle, and two more buried under the tender, all linked by a maze of steam pipes. The challenge was feeding all those cylinders with just one firebox and one boiler. Baldwin's shop teams wrestled with the sheer logistics. Piping steam to the rear engine meant running lines under the cab and through the tender, all while keeping the system tight enough to hold 210 pounds of pressure. The tender itself was not just a tank for coal and water anymore, it was now an engine in its own right, with its own set of eight drivers, all powered by exhaust steam from the main cylinders. The finished frame looked more like a steel centipede than a locomotive. 24 drivers in three sets, each one demanding its share of the boiler's output. As the last bolts were tightened and the paint dried, the scale of the gamble became clear. Baldwin had delivered exactly what the Erie asked for, a single monstrous pusher that could, in theory, do the work of three engines. But underneath the bravado, there were questions whispered in the shop. Could one firebox really keep six cylinders fed? Would the flexible boiler joint hold up under strain? The triplex was ready for trials, but even the men who built it wondered if the laws of physics would play along. The day the triplex rolled out for its first test in Binghamton, New York, the scale of the challenge was almost absurd. They coupled up a train of 250 loaded coal cars, nearly four and a half miles of steel and timber stretching out of sight in both directions. No other locomotive on earth had ever attempted to move that much weight in one piece. Crews lined the yard, waiting to see if the monster would even budge. With a hiss and a deep rolling thunder, the triplex leaned into the couplers. The sound was not the familiar chug of a steam engine, it was a continuous roar, a wall of noise from six massive cylinders all firing at once. The rails trembled. The ground seemed to vibrate. One by one, the cars started to move. First a groan, then a ripple, then the whole train in motion, wheels grinding and couplers straining under the load. At the throttle, the engineer watched as the pressure gauge held steady and the speed crept up, slow but unstoppable. The triplex was pulling a train longer than most towns, and it was not just moving, it was winning. Word spread fast. Reporters scribbled headlines about the king of the rails. Railroad men, who had spent their lives wrangling helpers, stood slack-jawed on the ballast. For a moment, brute force seemed to have conquered the limits of steel and steam. The triplex was not just a machine, it was a statement. For the Erie and for Baldwin, it was proof that the impossible could be made to move. Newspapers could not print headlines fast enough. The day after the triplex debut, the Binghamton Press ran a banner across the front page 
King of the Rails, Erie's monster engine shatters records. Reporters gushed about the train's impossible length and the sheer force behind each start. One column compared the triplex's tractive effort, 160,000 pounds, to the combined pull of two regular mallets, calling it a locomotive that could uproot trees or drag a mountain if given the chance. Magazine spreads featured side-by-side -side graphics, a standard 280 locomotive, a big mallet, and then the triplex, a steel centipede stretching across the page with its 24 driving wheels. The numbers did the talking. Most engines of the day managed 80,000 pounds of tractive effort. The triplex doubled that, at least on paper. Editors loved the phrase too strong for its own good. Industry journals speculated about the future. Would every railroad soon run monsters like this? Could a single engine make helper crews obsolete? Some writers wondered if the triplex would force a redesign of freight cars and couplers just to withstand its brute strength. The hype spread well beyond the eerie. Rail fans traveled from as far as Chicago just to catch a glimpse of the new king in the yard. For the eerie, the attention was a windfall. The triplex was not just a machine, it was a statement. It promised to break the old rules, to end the days of bottlenecks and helper congestion. In the glare of the press, it looked like the future had arrived on a tide of steel and steam. But behind the headlines, a different question was already starting to form among the men who would have to keep the giant fed and running. The first time the triplex faced Susquehanna Hill, the cab felt more like a pressure cooker than a workplace. The engineer eased open the throttle and the fireman set to work, shoveling coal into the firebox as fast as his arms would move. For a few minutes, power surged through all 24 drivers. The engine dug in and the heavy train started to crawl up the grade. In that moment, the crew could almost believe the hype. This was the monster that would conquer the hill. But the gauge told a different story. The needle, rock steady at 210 pounds when they left the yard, began to fall. Not a gentle drift, but a steady slide. The fireman threw coal like a man possessed, sweat running down his face, but the draft in the firebox just was not there. Only the front cylinder's exhaust pulled air through the fire. The rear engine's spent steam vented out the back, doing nothing to stoke the flames. The fire glowed dull orange instead of white hot. The engineer watched the gauge drop below 200, then 180. Every pound lost meant less muscle in the cylinders. The sound in the cab shifted. What started as a deep, rolling thunder faded into a ragged gasp. The train slowed. The engineer tried to coax more speed, but the triplex was already out of breath. The fireman's shovel hit the grates harder, but it was like trying to fill a bathtub with a teacup. The crew could feel the monster's strength slipping away. Reaching for the sanders, the engineer tried to keep the rear wheels from slipping as the tender got lighter with every scoop of coal and every gallon of water drawn down. The rear engine, once the secret weapon, started to lose traction. Every mile up the grade, the triplex was fighting its own design. In the heat and noise of the cab, frustration set in. The promise of a single engine replacing three was melting away with every drop in the needle. The crew did not need a technical manual to know what was happening. The triplex was suffocating. All that power was trapped by a firebox that could not keep up and a boiler that could not breathe. The cab became a lesson in limits, written in sweat and falling steam pressure. The strongest locomotive on earth was running out of air and there was nothing the men inside could do to stop it. Steam locomotives are a careful balance of appetite and muscle. The triplex upset that balance in ways no one could ignore. Its six cylinders demanded a river of steam, but the boiler, the engine's only source of breath, could not keep up. Even with a firebox stretched to nearly 12 feet and a great area expanded from 90 to over 100 square feet, the numbers never added up. At full throttle, the triplex could burn through 35,000 pounds of steam an hour, but the boiler could barely generate 25,000. The gap grew with every turn of the wheels. The problem ran deeper than just size. 
The triplex's three engines were arranged in a compound system. High pressure steam from the boiler drove the middle cylinders, which then exhausted to the front and rear low pressure cylinders. But only the front exhaust passed through the smoke box blast pipe, the heart of a steam engine's draft. That pulled air through the fire, kept the flames fierce, and boiled water at a furious rate. The rear exhaust was rooted out the back through a separate stack on the tender, and it bypassed the smoke box entirely. Half the spent steam never helped stoke the fire. As a result, the firebox starved for air, and the boiler's output sagged just when the engine needed it most. The tender engine, meant to turn dead weight into tractive effort, brought its own trap. At the start of a run, the tender was heavy with coal and water, pressing the rear drivers firmly onto the rails. But as the triplex worked, every shovelful of coal and every gallon of water used made the tender lighter. That meant less weight on the rear wheels, less grip, more slip. By the time the train was halfway up the hill, the very feature that made the triplex unique was losing its hold. The more the engine worked, the weaker its rear legs became. The physics were merciless. The triplex could deliver a tractive effort of 160,000 pounds at the coupler, double what any mallet could manage. But that was only true for the first few minutes, with a full tender and a boiler at peak pressure. As soon as the climb began in earnest, steam demand outstripped supply, the draft collapsed, and the rear drivers started to spin. No amount of sand or frantic shoveling could change the math. The triplex was a bodybuilder with a single set of lungs, a sprinter who ran out of breath before the finish line. Its power was real, but it was power that could not last. Every year, engineers push for more, bigger, faster, stronger. But physics answers to no ambition. Today, as industries chase records in everything from AI to energy, the triplex stands as a warning. Scale without balance fails. The most powerful machine means nothing if it cannot endure. Ambition needs limits, or the laws of nature will set them for us. What limits do you think we are ignoring now? Let me know below.